What an amazing time in worship, amen? And you guys were singing that song, My, my Anchor Holds Within the, the Veil. And every high and stormy gale, it's like, man, my anchor holds. And I'm just, I'm, I'm reminded of, of just the, um, when, the, when the, uh, the disciples were in the boat and uh, Jesus was sleeping on the boat and, uh, and a storm arose all of a sudden. And, man, they were freaking out. I don't know about you, but I would have been freaking out too. I mean, I can swim, but not like that, especially in those conditions. I just, you know. But, man, they, they got to a point where they thought they were going to die. And then they remembered who was in the boat. They said, Jesus, Jesus, you got to wake up. We're about to die. Jesus rose, and he calmed the storm. Sometimes storms arise in our lives all of a sudden. We didn't know where they came from. Everything was going nice. The sea is calm in your life, and the storm arises. But I'm here to remind you, who's in the boat with you? I'm glad I got a witness over here. I said, you got to remember who's in the boat with you. Is the king of kings not in the boat with you? Is the Lord of all not in the boat with you? Did he say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's who's in the boat with you. So if you're going through a storm, Jesus is in the boat. Cry out to him. He will calm the storm. Amen. Come on and put your hands together for the storm calmer. Oh, he is Lord. He is Lord. Well, you got me today. Surprise. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue on in our, uh, our study in the book of Philippians. Um, and so I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get up again. We call that church aerobics. Up, down, up, down, high intensity workout, you know? I'm trying to go ahead and look out for your health. So we're looking in the, in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, and we're going to read four scriptures. Book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27, and we're going to read through verse 30. When you got to say so, I'll wait a moment. Okay, let's do it. Starting in verse 27, it says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast. They stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you a salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer, say suffer, suffer. for his sake, having the, name, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you, my God, because you are our all in all, my God. We thank you, my Lord God, because we know that you're going to speak to our hearts today, dear Lord God. The question is, will we have ears to hear and hearts willing, my Lord God, to repent? Father, grant us repentance this morning. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to each and every one of us here today, dear God. We don't want to leave the same, dear God. Transform us. Change us in your presence. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So, so far in this series, we've learned that being the light is only possible when the body of Christ is unified, say unified, unified, around the gospel. The unity around the gospel provokes fellowship. It develops assurance and it inspires love. Can you agree with me that the world needs a little love? Yes, yes. And you are those agents to go ahead and spread that love. Having this unified gospel-centered mindset is the key to having a unified focus that will advance the cause of Christ 
cause us to rejoice where God is at work, and produce a sure hope inside each and every one of us. Being of one mind, unified around the gospel, and having a unified focus should produce in us a conduct, right? A people, right? As a people, we, a, a conduct that is consistent, cooperative, and confident. So all those things that we've covered thus far are great in here. But until we put them into practice, I said until we put them into practice, they just remain here, right? We haven't been called to be sideline Christians, right? This is not a spectator sport. When you said yes to Christ, you said yes to getting into the game. When you said yes to Christ, you're like, you know what, Lord? Do with me as you will. You remember that day, right? You were boohooing, right? It's not running down your face. You were looking a mess, right? But you didn't care because you had Jesus. You had Jesus. And you were like, Lord, if you can use anything, Lord. <laughs> that was you. That was you. But you get a little knowledge in you, right? You get a little word in you, right? And all of a sudden you're like, if you can use anything, Lord, use them. Use them, Lord, because they need you, right? Man, we got we to gotta return to our first love. Say, Lord, I got the knowledge, now use me. I'm equipped, now use me doesn't become real until you get in there. You can read all the books on how to do it, how not to do it, which way to do it, but until you do it, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. But the amazing thing about Christianity is once you start doing it, once you start doing what God has called you to do, hmm, it's exciting. It's not boring. Words leap up off the page. You apply it to your life, and you're like, wow, this really works. I am changed. I am different. I walk differently. I talk differently. It's amazing. The main point that I want you to walk away with today is this. When we decide to follow Christ and allow our souls to steep in the gospel, our conduct cannot remain the same. It just can't. It's impossible. When you submit yourself to God's word, when you meditate upon it day and night, your life is changed. Your thinking is changed. As your thinking is changed, your heart is changed. As your heart is changed, your behavior changes. As your behavior changes along the line, your character changes. I was talking to a friend recently. I've known this friend for a long time, a long time. And I know this guy pretty well. Recently, he decided to give his life to the Lord, right? And so through this whole time, I have just seen an amazing change in this man's life. He decided to submit his life to the Lord. He decided to say, you know what? I've tried everything else. I'm going to try Jesus. <laughs> I'm just saying. The change that I've seen in this man's life, I know God is real. I know God is real. His conduct has changed. Attitude changed. When things come up, he would fly off the handle. And my man was, when I tell you my man was crazy, let me tell a little story. Tell a little story. So I was hanging out with my man. Hanging out. All of a sudden, he gets some not so good news, right? We're standing outside his apartment. This door that, uh, that to his apartment is like a metal door, you know, solid, right? One man got upset and started punching this door. Bah, 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 again, boom, boom. And I was like, are you okay? Because my hand hurts, and I'm not doing nothing. I looked at the door. It was dented. Knuckles bloody. I looked in his eyes, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Who are you? 
<laughs> I'm leaving. I'll call you later. Went from that to the man that I see today. I'm like, wow. When we submit ourselves to God, when we allow our hearts and our souls to steep in the gospel, our conduct can help it be changed. We're going to unpack that a little bit. This first point, repeat after me. Say, a conduct worthy. Okay, but like you mean it, okay? I'm going to need some help this morning, okay? Like you mean it. I mean it. Come on. A conduct worthy. A conduct worthy. Better. Of the gospel. Of the gospel. Is consistent. Is consistent. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as believers, we are called to walk a certain way, are we not? Say yes. Yes, yes we are called to walk a certain way. It is a different way than how we used to walk before we knew Christ. Is different. If you turn to the book of Ephesians, which is one, one book over, Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul tells us how to walk. Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness, lowliness, and gentleness. Sometimes we got to be gentle, right? With long suffering, long suffering, that's, that's, that's hard. That's being patient with the knuckleheads in your life, okay? Not flying off the handle, wanting to choke them. Not laying hands on them, right? Praying for them, interceding for them, giving them a word, right? Long suffering. Because you know what? You're the knucklehead in somebody else's life. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's you. Just how you can't stand somebody else, well, somebody else can't stand you. We all need a little bit of long suffering, right? Now be patient, right? Be patient with one another, knowing that God is at work in each and every one of us, right? We're all a work in progress. Some of us got a little bit more work, others, you know, but we all got some work. Bearing with one another in love, mm. endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is how we should walk. This is how we should conduct ourselves. Not just sometimes, but consistently. I'm not saying for you to be perfect, but what is your walk like? What is your conduct like? Because you're consistently doing something, what you doing? That's what you got to ask yourself. How am I living? How am I walking? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 20, it talks about us being a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. The old things have passed away, right? We knew, right? Not only that, we are ambassadors for Christ. I'm an ambassador. In case you didn't know it. You're an ambassador too. If you're saved, you put your trust in Jesus, are you now not a citizen of heaven? Right? You're not from here no more, right? You're from heaven because you're a citizen of heaven, right? You're an ambassador on behalf of heaven, right? on behalf of Christ. You're a sojourner, a pilgrim just passing through. So I... I looked at that word ambassador, and I'm like, okay, so I know what an ambassador is, sort of, but you know how it is. got to look it up in the dictionary to know, no. You can't use the same word, you know, uh, to define a word. You know, an ambassador is not somebody who ambassadates or something. I don't know. Really. <laughs> Making up words. Well, we are a core faith church where, where we make up words when there are no words. An ambassador is one who represents their home country's policies and interests around the world. Policies and interests, right, around the world. Somebody who represents, who says, hey, this is what we represent back in my home country. So if your home country is heaven, what you representing? The values of heaven? The conduct of heavenly citizens? 
Or is it something else? Something you just made up or like sort of kind of when I feel like it? What is that kind of like? What is it you're representing? What kind of ambassador are you? Who does your conduct say you represent? You're representing somebody. Who? Let me tell you a little story. In my house, right? I'm sorry. In my dad's house. I don't live in there no more. I live in my, I got my own, I pay my own bills. I'm a big boy now, right? But when I lived at my dad's house, my dad was like, you live here, right? You gonna live? By my rules, thank you, babe. See? Always count on you. So amazing. You gonna live by my rules, right? Because when you get out of here, you represent me. So wherever you go, you carry the Banos name, okay? So Banoses are what? We're courteous. Banoses are kind. Banoses say please and thank you. Banoses open the door. Banoses close the door behind them. Those are what the Banos boys do. That's who we were, the Banos boys. Where are we going? Us three, just all over the place. And then we had the sister. <laughs> My parents went off the rails with that one. I don't know what happened. I was like, man, you guys used to be tough. What happened to you? You softened up on me. Come on. But my dad did that because wherever we went, we represented him. And he's like, man, I need to teach you so that when I'm not around, you know how to act. You know what to do. Because we're representing God has spoken to us, has he not? Has taught us, hasn't he? It's in his word. He speaks to us. He pours into us. He, he brings other people in our lives to pour into us, to help us along the way, to disciple us, to teach us, to train us, to keep us accountable. So then when we're out there representing, we know who exactly we're representing. We know how to act. And then it doesn't become an act. It just becomes who we are. We do these things not because we have to, but because that's who we are. Being a Christian is not what I do. It's who I am. That's who I am. Why? Because I've been impacted by him, the lover of my soul. I've read what his word says about me. And what he's entrusted me to do. So when I'm out there, I can't be acting crazy. I, be, I gotta be consistent in my walk. I have to consistently show what a citizen of heaven looks like, how he acts, how he speaks. So, what kind of ambassador are you? You know who we can ask? We can ask the people that you know you you work with. We can ask the people, we can ask the people that you live with. Whenever I do interviews, I always ask this question. And it, it trips me out when I ask it. I ask, I say, hey, um, so what would your previous supervisor say about you? You get some people that are like, can can you repeat the question? <laughs> What would your previous supervisor say about you? Would they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I start out good, but now I become lazy? Is that what they would say about you? I mean, right, most people say three things. I'm a team player, I'm punctual, and I forget what the other one is, but it's, it's a hard worker. Hard worker, punctual, team player. Those are usually the top three. Nobody ever says, listen, I, you know, I disappear for 20 minutes at a time. <laughs> Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says, you know, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I'm not feeling it. So I need a mental health week. Not a day. Mental health week, wow. you know. I got to recover. I don't, anyway. You know, it's funny because the people that I work, sometimes, you know, um, I'll hear them say, man, you know, so-and-so's not working. So-and-so's not working. They never come up to me and tell me, you know, Aldo, man, 
I've been slacking. Like, my work ethic is horrible this week. You know, I just, I'm just a terrible worker. I, you know what? I think you should write me up. I, you know, just write me up right now because I need, I need to get on this discipline track. You know what I'm saying? I just, put me on an action plan, please. <laughs> I'm terrible. Nobody says that. But if you were to ask your coworkers, right? Okay, so how does so-and-so work? What does so-and-so do? They might not like you, but if you're a hard worker, it's evident. If you're the first one to go ahead and get up and go do the work, it's evident. Nobody can argue with that. What does our conduct look like out there? Who would people say that we represent? Is our conduct consistent? 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. I'm going to turn that. Let me turn that. Because this is it's real good. First Peter 2. It says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims, right? Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conduct, say conduct, honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So they might speak against you, but they got to say, hey, your works speak for themselves. I may not like you because, you know, whenever we want to go right, you're always like, no, guys, we got to go left. Sorry. You can either come with me or you can... Whenever somebody's in need, you're the first one to be like, hey, let's go and see, let's see what we can do. But that person, saw me. that person said, and you're still willing to help? Mm-hmm. I'm still willing because I'm a citizen of heaven. I represent Christ in my workplace, in my family. That's who I represent. Second point, repeat after me, say, a conduct worthy worthy of the gospel gospel is cooperative. 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 With one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's the end of 27, verse 27. So not only am I an ambassador for Christ, but you are ambassadors for Christ. You know what a group of ambassadors is called? A delegation. So we are a delegation on behalf of Christ. Doesn't that make you feel special? It's good, right? Rights and privileges, I like that. Responsibility, that's where we get hung up, right? It's like, oh, it comes with responsibility. This one thing to labor and another thing to co-labor, right? When you co-labor, you're like, okay, it's a group of us. Ooh, okay, all right, listen. By myself, I can only accomplish a little bit. But together... <laughs> Together, we could take on the world. I saw a cartoon the other day, and uh, it was a boat. And inside the boat, there was a donkey and an elephant. It was a rowboat, right? (laughs) The donkey was rowing in one direction, and the elephant was rowing in the opposite direction. They were going around and around and around. They weren't going nowhere. Why? Because they weren't cooperating. They weren't pulling in the same direction. We can't be like that. We can't be like that. Now, you guys know that I'm, like, not competitive at all, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm slightly com- ultra competitive. Um yeah, it's just, it's in me. It's like in my bones, right? And, um, and I pass it on to my children. I'm sorry, babe. Vanessa's like not competitive at all. She's like, ah, it's fine. I'm like, what do you mean? Come on! <laughs> when we used to play, my brothers and I growing up, um, we, we didn't play for fun. We played to win, okay? If we're not winning, it's not fun, Okay. <laughs> So if you were ever, my little brother was, he, my little brother was intense, all right? 
especially before Christ, he was like extra intense. And so if you were ever on his team, okay, it was the winning team, okay? We were going to win. I don't care if you hurt your hand, your leg, you twist it. No, get up and play. If not, get off my team, somebody else come in. That's my brother. That guy always played at like 150%. And the other people that played with him, they better play at 120%. Because if not, boy, you were going to get the business. He was going to yell at you. He was going to tell you, da, 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 da. I hated playing on his team. But we always won, so that was fun. Because that's how it is. But if you missed your assignment, like if you're supposed to be guarding, if you're playing basketball, you're supposed to be guarding this guy over here, and he is just killing it. My brother, me, are you tired? You want to go home? Or did you come to play? I came to play. <laughs> then play. Don't miss the assignment. You got a job to do. I can't guard my man and your man. Be there. Okay. Sacrifice the body if you have to. He didn't care. I'm like, bro, we're not getting paid. I don't care. <laughs> but that's how he was. But let me tell you, that man would play with all his heart. All his heart. And it was inspirational, right? He'd be like, man, if he was playing hard, man, I wanted to play hard. If he was going all out, I wanted to go all out. I didn't care if I was getting cramps and my legs were locking up. It didn't matter. Grab a Gatorade, sit out for a minute, and come back in. <laughs> it's all good. But that's how he was. It's crazy because when I, when I see Paul going through his suffering, man, my man is going 150%. He's going all out. He's in chains. He's, you know, locked up, and he's still got this joy. He's still encouraging. He's still challenging. I mean, to the point where... Earlier in the series, he talks about how his sufferings for the sake of the gospel spurred others to step their gospel game up. It's like, man, if, I, if Paul is over here suffering for the sake of the gospel, why can't we? Let's get bold, right? And so when you see your other brothers and sister out there living all out, don't be hating on them. I'm be guilty of that in the past. Be like, oh, this, look at this one, excited, man. Calm down. Calm down. What do you mean calm down? That guy's got the passion. That guy's got the fire. He's out there doing the work. What am I doing? I'm just sitting back. Praise Jesus. Go to church on Sundays. Go to my Connect Life group. I'm just living my life. Man, but I'm, am I making an impact? Am I being that ambassador that God has called me to be? Am I living all out? Am I giving it my all? It's unfortunate because at times that answer is, mm, not really. We got to live all out. We got to cooperate with our brothers and sisters. I can't go where you go. I don't work where you work. I'm not around the people that you're around. That's your assignment. Just like you're not around the people I'm around. You don't work with those people. You don't see them 40 hours a week. I do. As I'm over here in my assignment, I got to trust that you're over there in your assignment. And when we come together and we talk about our assignments, you're on task. I'm on task. You're asking me. I'm asking you. Yo, are you living out loud? Did you miss your assignment? Or are you on it? We got to cooperate for the sake of the gospel. This is bigger than each and every one of us. We're a delegation, right? We're a delegation. What are we doing? Tough questions, right? Tough question. My last point. Say a conduct worthy of the gospel is confident. Continue with the sports analogy, right? When you're engaged in like a seven-game series and you win the first game, 
What does that produce? Confidence, right? You're like, oh, we got this. Unless you're the magic, and then it just, I don't know. I know. We just got lucky. Anyway, there's always next year, and the year after, and the year after that, and the year after that. Mm. When you win the second game, ooh, now you got momentum. You hit the third game, <laughs> you're unstoppable. Sometimes what happens is that we hit that first game, and we confident. We hit that second game, and we drop the ball in that second game. Wah, wah, wah. You know what the amazing thing is, though, about the battle that we are engaged in? Is at the end of the war, we win. We win. So if you drop a battle or two, be encouraged. Because at the end of it, we win. You know what we used to say when we used to play basketball on the, on the, um, on the playground? If my team, right, was a good team, which if my brother was on the team, it was a great team, and we lost by a narrow margin, you know what we would say? Three words. Three words. That's it. Run it back. Run it back. Let's play. Ball up. Let's go. Because I barely missed it. Come on. We got this. Listen, you're on the winning side. You're on the winning team. So just because you drop a battle, God is saying, yo, run it back. What, you going to take the ball and go home? You could do that. Come on now. We win at the end. Run it back. Ball up. That's not had nothing to do with my point, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in our lives, we've always had battles, right? We battle for Carline. Carline is of the devil. I'm telling you, seriously. I, whoever invented, I don't. I don't even. Don't be stressing me out. I'd be lining up early, and then there'd be gaps in the line. I'm like, what y'all doing? What y'all doing? <laughs> anyway, we battle in Carline, right? We battle for a promotion at work. I got to get that degree. I got to earn that degree because I got to get, get promoted. I got to make more money because, you know, I got bills to pay. I want to go on vacation. <laughs> That's so funny he left. Um, but we battle, right? We battle for, for things. And all those, you know, this, it's just temporary. It's for here, for here on earth, you know? When we decided... We decided to accept Christ in our lives. Our battles didn't end. They just changed. We had brand new battles with eternal implications. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, our battles went to like another dimension. Whoever said that once you trust in Christ, things are going to get easier was lying to you. Things are going to get harder. But, but, who's in the boat with you? Jesus Christ himself, right? So we can overcome. We will overcome because the overcomer is on our side. And if God is with you, I said, if God is with you, yeah. let me hear you at home. If God is with you, yeah. exactly. I heard you from all the way over here. You guys are so loud. So in this life, we have those who are going to oppose us. As Bishop was talking about last week, the haters, right? Those are going to hate on you. Because, oh, now you a Christian. Oh, now you too good to be going out. Oh, now you're too good to be participating in this. Oh, now you're too good to be laughing at that joke. Like, no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm living differently. But they're going to hate on you. But that's okay, because you know who else they hated on? Jesus. 
when you stand, when you decide to stand for Jesus, haters going to come. Don't be surprised. But not only don't be surprised, don't be alarmed. Because he is on your side. There are going to be those that are going to be opposing you. But you keep on. We see some encouragement here in verses 29 through 30. We see first that to suffer for Christ is proof of our salvation, right? If you are saved, you will suffer for Christ. That's what's going to happen. So if you are not suffering for Christ, you got some questions to ask yourself, right? I'll, I'll leave that one there. I'll leave that one there. It is a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. It is no privilege to suffer for your own foolishness. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you suffer because you made bad decisions, hey, sometimes you got to go ahead and eat that up. Sorry, it just is what it is. But for, to suffer for the sake of Christ is a privilege. It is a privilege. It's a way, right, that we show, we get to show our commitment to him. I mean, I, I'm not suffering for no lie. And I am not suffering for something that I am not, like, totally 100% in on. I'm just not doing that. But when I'm in, it's a privilege. They hate it on Christ, man, they're going to hate on me. That's a privilege because I'm, I'm standing up for him. He died for me. He died for my sins. And so it is a privilege to stand for him. And if they're going to hate on me, that's okay. But my works will show what's up. And at the end, they'll be like, you know what? We didn't like him because he was saying truth, and, but we saw his works. That man was really about God's business. It's also a way to prove to ourselves where we are in our commitment to him. I used to love tests when I, when I was in school, like the third time. <laughs> when I went back to school, it was awesome because I was like, these tests, I had like an epiphany. I said, these tests are not just for the teacher to see where I am. Where it's for me to see where I am myself, right? Because, you know, you might know something. You might study something. You teach somebody else this or whatever. But when the test comes, then you know for real if you don't know it or if you do. Let me give you an example. I had a text in x-ray physics. Now, I could have sworn... Then my teacher said, I'm going to provide you certain formulas. I was like, all right, I'm good. Well, whether he provides them or not, I know them. I got that. So I'm zipping through the test, and I'm like, okay. This, this, this. Then I get to the, the question that we're supposed to use the formula. And I'm like, Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, Aldo? Oh, Jerry. Uh, yeah. Where are the formulas? In your head. No, they're not. Well, they should have been. Well, you should have. And my man walks away. He leads me there to my own devices, not, not, giving, not even an inkling of what the formulas were. Man, I was so mad. I was so mad. But at the end of the test afterwards, I, I started to think about that test, and I'm like, you know what? I thought I knew, but I didn't know. That test showed me, you know what? I still had a little bit to go. I still needed to study more. So whenever you are going through your trials, whenever you're going through your testing and suffering and all that, that'll tell you where your heart is. You get squeezed. Let's see what's, what comes out. Let's see what comes out. Let's see what you've been steeping in. You've been steeping in the gospel. You've been steeping in God's word. 
or you've been steeping your soul in something else. Like, what's up? So it's a way for us to see where we're at, our commitment to him. Lastly, we don't suffer alone. The enemy will go ahead and have you <laughs> thinking that you suffer by yourself. That is a lie. That is why you should get into a connect life group. That way, you can surround yourself with believers. There's a connect group for a connect life group for everyone. Later on, after the service, come see me, and we will discuss that. I got you. If you are engaged in these life groups, as we are in conversation, you'll realize, man, you know what? People are going through the similar things that I'm going through. People are going through similar struggles that I'm going through. And you know what we can do? We can pray for one another. You know what we can do? We can encourage one another. We can remind one another. Lift one another up. That's what we're called to do, are we not? Yes, we are. I got a nod from Ozzy. I know. I know I'm doing good. Not, Ozzy's nodding. I like that. It is through suffering that we gain confidence that we are truly his and his alone. So in closing, I want to say this. The tone of Philippians is joy, but the theme is unity in Christ's likeness. Our unity around the gospel is fleshed out through our conduct. It is especially evident when we go through suffering. As Christians, our conduct should confirm the convictions of our hearts. We should team up with our brothers and sisters for the furtherance of the gospel. And our confidence is built as we suffer for Christ. So in closing, I got a question. You ready? Let me just start again. In closing, I've got a question. You ready? Yeah. Okay, good, good. What does your conduct say about your devotion to the gospel? Not, as what are your, not, not your intentions, not your thoughts, your conduct. What does your conduct say about your devotion to the gospel? Only you can answer that. I can't answer that for you. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right where you are. And I want you to think about that. Rewind this past week and answer that question. What does my conduct at work say about my devotion to the gospel? What does my conduct with my family say about my devotion to the gospel? What does my conduct around my friends say about my devotion to the gospel? What does my conduct when I'm alone say about my devotion to the gospel? Like I said, the amazing thing about God is that he walks through this life with us. We don't walk alone. And because of that, we can call upon his name. We can ask for forgiveness. We can repent in the areas in which we have not conducted ourselves as citizens of heaven. And as we repent, we turn away from those behaviors. We turn away from that type of thinking. And we turn to gospel-centered thinking. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come before you, dear God, as humbly as we know how. Recognizing, dear God, that there are certain areas in which we have not conducted ourselves as citizens of heaven. Father, I pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you would forgive our sins, my Lord God. Cleanse us afresh, my Lord. Help us to commit those areas to you, my Lord. We know that you have secured the victory over sin, my Lord God, on the cross for us. Your resurrection power is living inside each and every one of us, my God. You have given us the grace to be able to do what you've called us to do, to walk worthy of the calling with which you called us, my God. 
So I pray, dear God, that we would not make excuses, but I pray that we would recognize and repent. Cleanse us, my Lord God. Give us the strength, dear Lord. Help us to commit to you. Help us not to miss the assignments that you've given us, my God. Lives depend on it. Help us to be serious about your business, my God. Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on and put your hands together for Jesus. The hospitality ministry is looking for some new volunteers. So if you are interested or have any questions, please see me. Our core connects are underway, but if you haven't signed up for one, you can still get plugged in. For more info, please speak to Pastor Al. Join us October 2nd for our night of prayer beginning at 7 p.m. This is an amazing opportunity for our church to come together in worship and prayer. Married and engaged couples, please join us October 3rd at 9 a.m. for a great simulcast on marriage. The cost is $15 per person. Please make sure to register through Realm and please know that your registration includes breakfast. Childcare will not be provided. Core Kids is looking for some new volunteers. So if you are interested in being a teacher, a helper, or helping with some administrative tasks, please see Stephen Tessner. If you're new here or have been visiting us for some time, please join us for Coffee with the Leaders this Sunday following the first and second service. We hope to see you there. Hey there. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this service was a blessing to you. I pray that your faith was built. I pray that you were encouraged in this season of your life, wherever you are, whatever you're going through. I hope that God ministered to you. I hope that God called you to action and I hope that you'll take the next steps, whatever that is in your life. Uh, One thing that I want to say is that if this is your first time joining us online, please do me a favor and send me a message. You can send me a message to bishop at corefaithchurch.org. If you happen to be on Facebook, you can also just IM us there and we will respond to that message. But I'd love to just thank you for joining us and just hear from you. And if you have a prayer request, if we can pray for you in any way, uh, please let me know. You can also send again to bishop at corefaithchurch.org. We would love to pray for you and uh, just be there for you any way that we can. If there's any other way that we can serve you in this season, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. Also, I want to say thank you to all of you who have been joining us online weekly and have been faithful in your support of the ministry. One of the greatest things that I see and I'm so encouraged by is the fact that you are giving toward the cause of the gospel. God has called us to do this work and you are there with us. And so thank you so much for giving. Um, If you haven't given yet and you would like to give, all you have to do is text Core Faith to 73256. Again, just text Core Faith to 73256, and that will lead you to where you can go ahead and you can give one time, or you can set up on uh, ongoing giving. And so again, thank you so much for that. And if you have any questions, if you have a prayer request, or you want to contact us, please email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. I would love to hear from you. Hope to see you next week. God bless you.